What we need is not more medication, but more education, because the best prescription is knowledge. This is Exposé coming to you live from Lagos, Nigeria, every Monday on Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook simultaneously. And I'm the regular host, Tony Akiya. Don't, don't forget, what we need what is we not need more medication, medication, but more education, more education okay. because the best prescription is knowledge. Hello and welcome to Exposé with Tony Akinyami. It's another beautiful Monday evening here in Nigeria, West Africa. It's my privilege and my honor to always be your host. And our topic for discussion has been defeating diabetes naturally. We've had about three episodes to date in this series. And as we take episode four today, I want to talk about the causes of diabetes mellitus. Don't forget we differentiated between two kinds of diabetes, diabetes insipidus and diabetes mellitus. And we are extensively looking into diabetes mellitus at this time. We have looked at various aspects of it. What is it? What are the symptoms? And how do you test for it? What are the complications that can arise? if you don't address it properly. Now, we want to begin to dig into the causes of diabetes, and that will effectively bring the first segment to an end before we move to the second segment, where we begin to talk about the solution. We are just extraying the problem. We are analyzing the problem right now. So what causes diabetes? There are different factors. We will look at dietary factors, we will look at lifestyle factors, and then we will look at other factors, several of them grouped together. We call them other factors. So let's start with dietary factors. First, some studies have linked diabetes, particularly diabetes mellitus, to early introduction of cow's milk or soy proteins to the diet of infants, babies. When a new baby is born and that infant is introduced too early to cow's milk or soy proteins, uh, some studies have pointed to the fact that it could make that particular infant uh, be at risk for developing diabetes along the way, particularly type 1 diabetes. Now, there was a particular study that was carried out, I think, in Finland that actually threw this up. And um, the way it was explained in that study is that bovine insulin, that's the kind of insulin that is found in cow milk, it has a chemical structure that is very similar to the chemical structure of the beta cells of the pancreas. So when a baby is born, that baby's immunity is still in its infancy. It has not yet fully developed. That's why infants are at risk for infections and certain childhood diseases. So the infant depends largely on the immunity, immunity of the mother. So that's why the first milk that comes from the mother, which is called colostrum, is loaded with a lot of antibodies that the mother has produced and passed on to the baby. So the baby can be protected. And as the baby grows, the baby continues to mature its own immunity, its own immune system. The immune system of the infant begins to develop. So while the immune system is still developing, it is still learning, it is still profiling its environment to know what and what and what to get ready to defend the body against. If cow's milk or soy proteins are introduced into the child's diet at that stage, there are certain elements in the cow's milk that look like the beta cells of the pancreas. It's called the bovine insulin. And 
the immune system recognizing that bovine insulin coming into the body of that infant for the first time takes it as an invader, as an external enemy trying to invade the body. So the immune system will take a photograph of that particular bovine insulin and store it in its immune repertoire, in its immune memory, and record it there as an enemy on the wanted list. Because the immune system has its own repertoire, its own memory. Anytime the immune system comes against an enemy, it devises a way to take down the enemy. It takes a photograph of the enemy. I'm using layman's language to explain these things, okay? It takes the photograph of the enemy and stores it in its album. So that in the future, if the body comes across that same enemy, it already has its image, its photograph in its memory, and it remembers exactly how it dealt with it the first time it encountered it. So it doesn't take long, this second time around, for the body to deal with that thing because it has learned how to deal with it and it has stored the templates in its memory. And that is the principle behind inoculation of vaccination. When an individual is vaccinated, the typical vaccines of the past, that is, I'm not talking about the mRNA vaccines. I'm talking about the typical vaccines that we used to have in the past. Okay? Those vaccines used to have about five different ways that they developed them. The first way was to take a virus or an infectious agent, okay, and attenuate it. That is, weaken that virus. You don't kill it totally, but you just weaken it sufficiently that it cannot establish an infection if it is injected into a person. So a weakened virus or an attenuated virus is injected into an individual to make the immune system of that individual react to that attenuated virus and develop antibodies and then take the photograph of that virus, store it in its repertoire so that when that individual who has now developed antibodies in its blood, in its body, and has also learned how to decimate this particular virus. When that individual now comes across the real potent life virus out there in the day-to-day -day living of that individual, that body, that person's body does not need to waste time before it can deal with that virus because it has been primed, it has been prepared, it has learned how to do it. It has a template already. That's the principle of inoculation when you use a life attenuated uh, infectious agent. There's a second way they also do vaccines in the past, and that is the virus is actually killed. It is deadened, dead, completely dead. This one is not attenuated virus, dead virus. That is injected into the body. Again, all that the immune system needs to do is to take the photograph of the dead virus and store the image and then develop antibodies so that when it comes across the living virus, the life virus later in life, it can also fight it and win. A third way that they used to develop vaccines in the past was to take a fragment from the virus, maybe a protein fragment from the virus, and inject that fragment from the virus into the body so that the body, again, recognizes that agent as an external agent trying to invade the body, prepares an immune response, and stores the image and the template also in its repertoire. That's a third way that vaccines, traditional vaccines, were developed in the past. And the fourth way that traditional vaccines were developed in the past was actually to take the toxins produced by this infectious agent, not the infectious agent itself now, but the toxins produced by the infectious agent and use that to develop a vaccine. So let's say a bacterium produces a certain type of toxin whenever it gets into the body. You now harvest the toxin and you inject the toxin into the body because it is that toxin that actually causes disease, that causes problems. So the human body then develops a reaction to that toxin and now again stores the template in its repertoire. That's the fourth way that vaccines used to be developed in the past. They are called toxoid vaccines. And then the fifth way that vaccines were developed in the past is through uh, harvesting the antibodies from the body of somebody who has been infected and has recovered. An individual who has been infected by a virus, for example, 
who has developed antibodies to fight that virus successfully, and that individual has already recovered. You now take the blood of that individual, harvest the antibodies from that person's blood to make vaccines. That is called a passive vaccine. When that is pumped into the body now, it does not stimulate that person's body, the recipient's body, to develop its own antibodies. But it actually uses those antibodies that have already been harvested from another person to fight the infection. Usually, those kind of passive vaccines are administered to people who are already infected. And you want to treat them, so you put that uh, antibody into that person's. So those were the five classic ways that vaccines were produced in the past. Of course, they also add a lot of adjuvants to them in order to potentiate them, to make them more effective. Okay, I won't go into the details of that because we are not discussing, discussing vaccines today. But now we have a new system of a new technology for developing vaccines, uh, the mRNA technology, for example, which is what was used to develop the Pfizer COVID vaccine and the Moderna COVID vaccine. Uh, and those are all recent technologies, and uh, they don't use any of those five. That's why there have been a lot of cry and hue about these COVID vaccines as not necessarily being the traditional vaccines. Therefore, they require a lot of testing, a lot of you know, studies to be sure regarding their efficacy and their safety before they are deployed. But let's leave that discussion. What I'm talking about is causes of diabetes. And I went into that, I digressed into that to explain how early introduction to cow's milk or soy protein, we call it soya here in Nigeria, they call it soy in other climes, okay? Soy protein or soya protein to the diet of babies. There is something in cow's milk that is called bovine insulin. Bovine means from cow, okay? Bovine insulin that when it is introduced too early into the life of an infant, the diet of an infant, maybe the infant is two months old, three months old, and you already introduce cow's milk or soy protein into the body of that child, that child's immune system is still taking photographs, starting to learn the enemies around that it needs to prepare its body against. It sees this, the, 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 this, this strange protein you know, molecules as enemies. And then it takes the photograph, unfortunately, and stores it in its memory as an enemy, such that any time it sees that particular protein, it launches an attack. The immune system will launch an attack, and there will be an immune response, an immune reaction. The person can develop allergic reactions. The person can develop autoimmune disorders against that particular protein. Now, like I said, that bovine insulin has a similar chemical structure. In other words, using layman's language, it resembles, it looks like, the, 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 the cells in the islet of Langerhans, it, the cells in the beta, the beta cells of the pancreas, responsible for insulin production. So now, in the future, as the immune system of that person who has already taken the photograph of this bovine insulin and stored it in the memory as an enemy, when that same immune system goes on surveillance, because the immune system has two major components, you have the innate immunity and you have the adaptive immunity. Now, the adaptive immunity is internal, while the innate immunity is the outer shell. Now, the internal adaptive immunity is essentially your white blood cells and the various antibodies that are produced to fight the enemy. So, once the adaptive immunity goes on surveillance, it has the team that goes on patrol, goes on surveillance all over the place. It has the ones that are the artillery units that will fight the enemy once an enemy has been identified. Okay, so when the innate, or the adaptive immunity rather, goes on surveillance, it gets to the pancreas and then it sees the beta cells in the pancreas that produce insulin and it says, I've seen this person before. This one is in my album. I've taken this photograph before, not knowing that it was not the beta cells that it took the photograph, but rather a protein in cow's milk or soy protein, that it mistakes it for that enemy, and then it begins to fire salvos, and the immune system will launch an attack against the pancreas and destroy all the insulin-producing cells of the pancreas. That child then grows up to become type 1 diabetic. So that's one of the dietary factors responsible for early childhood or juvenile onset diabetes mellitus. 
Uh, the study was done, I think, in Finland, uh, and I think a few others have also corroborated that same study. It's published in a peer-reviewed journal, and um, it's an indication. Of course, it doesn't mean that every child that is exposed to cow milk or soya milk will develop. Just a few, but you never can tell who are the few that will develop it. I'll be back very shortly, and we will continue this discussion, very important discussion, because when we know the cause of a problem, it's easier for us to prevent that problem in the future or to solve that problem even now. So the first dietary factor we have looked at is early introduction of cow's milk or soy protein to the diet of babies. That's why we advocate exclusive breastfeeding for babies for the first six months of their lives. One of the reasons, not the only reason, but one of the reasons is to protect them from developing type 1 diabetes. I'll see you shortly. You can actually reverse diabetes. When you understand diabetes, you understand what it is, you understand how it happens, the risk factors, the causes, and the complications that it can give rise to. Those who already have it, to start putting measures in place to reverse it or at the very least to control it. My daughter is a medical doctor and I am a nutritionist. We co-authored the Fitting Diabetes Naturally. You will find it on Amazon.com and you can also buy hard copies uh, from our bookshop, The Shepherd Stores Limited, the number 18 Shogunda Street, Abuyoni Babo, Ikeja, Lagos, Nigeria. Welcome back. This has been Expose with Tony Akinyami. And don't forget, what we need is not more medication, but more education. That's why I'm taking my time to break it down into bite sizes so that you can chew it, process it, internalize it, and be equipped and well fortified to prevent diabetes or to reverse diabetes. And the information I'm providing regarding dietary factors in the causation of diabetes is particularly very useful to parents because I have seen certain parents who introduce these things to their children so early, not for any reason other than the fact that they don't want to breastfeed. I have seen mothers who will say, oh no, I don't want to breastfeed my child for too long because I don't want my breast to sag. I want to be there for my husband. <laughs> uh, the bad news is that no matter what you do, as you age, your breast will sag. That's the bad news. So why not just let your baby be well nourished, well breastfed, so that you can, you know, give that baby a head start in life as far as his or her health is concerned. Like I said before we went on that short break, we advocate exclusive breastfeeding for the first six months of life for your baby. That's one of the best gifts you can give to your baby in life. Now, maybe when we get there sometimes in the future, we'll be talking about the value of breastfeeding. I mean, awesome, awesome, awesome. The value of breastfeeding. More than a dozen major health benefits derivable from breastfeeding your child very well. The first six months exclusively with nothing else added. And then you start introducing adult food after the child has clocked six months old. Of course, there is no place whatsoever for infant formula. You don't need baby formula, except in special cases. Maybe when the mother is not lactating at all and cannot you know, possibly breastfeed the baby, or maybe when um, the mother is very sick and maybe taking certain medications, and those medications will be expressed in the breast milk, and you don't want the baby to take in those medications because they are too strong for the baby, in that case, alternative feeding methods can be, you know, designed for the baby. Or maybe an infant was born and the mother died, okay, during childbirth. 
that baby has to be fed one way or the other, okay? Uh, those are the exceptional cases where baby formula comes in. But if a mother is alive, a mother is well, and a mother is lactating, I personally submit that it is a crime not to breastfeed your baby for any other reason. It's a crime. That's why employers even give maternity leaves. You have a minimum of three months or thereabouts to breastfeed that baby. In some cases, six months. In fact, in some countries, they give them up to one year to stay with their baby, nourish that baby properly, breastfeed that baby properly, take care of that baby properly. You know, a lot of benefits derivable, one of which is that when you breastfeed your baby very well exclusively for the first six months of life, it even helps the IQ of the child to be high. Cognitive function, brain power, that child will be well, well, you know, brain developed, intelligent, brilliant when they are well breastfed. I normally joke among my friends that my mother breastfed me for two years. And that has helped my IQ a lot, and you can tell. <laughs> That's on a lighter note. Anyway, jokes apart, early introduction of cow's milk or soy protein to the diet of babies has been identified as one of the dietary factors that help to cause the development or the initiation of diabetes mellitus. Number two dietary factor is a short duration or absence of breastfeeding. When the child is not breastfed properly, when the duration of breastfeeding is very short or it is absent completely, that child is at a higher risk of developing diabetes later in life. I mean, I have explained that when I was explaining the first point. The third one, third dietary factor, is obesity or being overweight, particularly the abdominal type of obesity where the abdominal region is bulging as if the person is pregnant, whether it's a man or a woman, when a man is obese and he has a bubble in the middle, that puts that person at a higher risk of developing diabetes than the average person on the street. So that is a dietary factor because you don't become obese or become overweight except through your diet. It is your diet that you know, sculpts you and creates the shape that you have. If you are too thin, your diet contributes to that. If you are obese, your diet contributed to that as well. So that's why we bring obesity or being overweight under dietary factors. Now, the fourth dietary factor that can contribute to the development of diabetes mellitus is consumption of junk foods. Many of us are experts at consuming junk foods. We like patronizing fast food centers. We like processed food. We like refined products. All of these things contribute to the development of disease, particularly diabetes mellitus. That's the fourth dietary factor. Dietary factor number five that contributes to the causation of diabetes is bad fat intake. Now, I'll leave it alone and I'll come back to it. I want to close with that because it's very critical. So the sixth one is what I call excessive intake of animal protein. Now, Dr. Willard Visek, a professor of clinical sciences at the University of Illinois Medical School, stated, and I quote, a high-protein diet also breaks down the pancreas and lowers resistance to cancer as well as contributes to the development of diabetes, unquote by Dr. Willard Visek, a professor of clinical sciences at the University of Illinois Medical School. So excessive intake of animal protein can predispose an individual to developing diabetes, according to Dr. Willard Visek, a medical doctor and a professor. All right, now excessive intake of animal protein may contribute to diabetes, but the one that contributes the most in my personally considered opinion is bad fat intake, particularly trans fat in fried foods, in margarine. You find them in all the various processed oils that we consume, hmm. particularly fast food, fried food. How does bad fat contribute to diabetes? I'm going to explain. I mean, it's very straightforward. 
Just stay with me. Now, let's go back to O-level biology. In O-level biology, we are told that our cells are the basic units of life. The cells. We have plant cells, we have animal cells. And you know the structure of a cell. Simply put, a cell is like a circle, you know, round like that. The boundary is called the cell membrane or the cell wall. The cell membrane. And then you have the cytoplasm. At the center, you have the nucleus inside there. In the nucleus, you have all kinds of different things there. You have your, that's why you have your DNA. That's why you have the mitochondria where your, your glucose is converted into adenosine triphosphate or ATP for energy, fuel for energy, and what have you. But I'm, I'm more concerned about the structure of a cell, particularly uh, the cell of a human being. You see, the cell membrane is very, very critical. It is the gateway by which nutrients enter into the cell and waste products exit from the cell, okay, the cell membrane. So take note of that. It is the gateway, the cell membrane. Now, the cell membrane, the major constituent, the major nutrient that is used to construct the cell membrane is fat. Fat. So the type of fat that you use in constructing the membrane of new cells, the type of fat you use, will determine the membrane fluidity. The membrane fluidity. In other words, how easy for nutrients to go in and how easy for waste products to get out from the cell. So if you use the right type of fat, if you use fat from avocado pia, for example, coconut oil, okay, omega-3 oil, if you use those kind of fats, those are good fats. If you use those kind of fats, if they are, your diet is rich in them, and those are the fats that your body uses to construct your cell membrane, then your, your, your cell membrane fluidity will be good. Nutrients can easily enter, waste products can easily go out. But when you use bad fats, such as from margarine, from lard, L-A-R-D, okay, uh, uh, from, from fried food, that's trans fat. If that is what you use to construct your cell membrane, because that's the type of raw materials, the type of building block you're putting into your body, then your cell membrane integrity will not be sound. It will be compromised because you are using fake raw materials to construct your cell membrane. That will affect your cell membrane fluidity. That is one of the reasons for insulin resistance. When insulin is knocking the cell to say, open, glucose wants to exit from the blood into the cell because you use something almost close to plastic to construct your cell membrane because that's what is in your diet, then your cell will not respond to the action of insulin properly. And so you develop insulin resistance or insulin insensitivity. You see, and once you have insulin resistance, that's type 2 diabetes there. Because then sugar cannot leave your blood to enter into your cell. You can now understand how bad fat or trans fat or fried food can contribute to the development of diabetes. You know, many people think that, oh, it is sweet food, sugar, and sweet fruits that make people develop diabetes. Hmm. Bad fat contributes more. Now, if a person has very good cell membrane and sugar or glucose can leave the blood successfully easily and enter into the cells, even if the person drinks a bottle of soft drink with about 11 cubes of sugar, immediately insulin kicks in and begins to open the doors and the doors of the cells. All the sugar will be mopped up and the sugar level will come down. Of course, that's not a good idea. I'm not suggesting you should start taking soft drinks because, again, when you put your entire sugar management mechanism into fire brigade mode because you, they, they are always, there's always a sugar spice. You're always consum consuming soft drinks and, and packaged fruit juices and alcohol and all of those things, and your, your, your sugar management mechanism is always swinging into action to do a mop-up action, you will soon wear it out. Everything will collapse and break down. And that can also result in, in diabetes, okay? But I'm looking at the mechanism of how sugar leaves your bloodstream 
and enters into the cells through your cell membrane. The material used to construct your cell membrane will determine how easy sugar can penetrate through it to enter into the cells so that your cells, the mitochondria in your cells, can now convert the sugar, the glucose, into adenosine triphosphate or ATP, which is the refined petroleum to run your generator, to run your engine, if you understand that layman's language. Okay, so that is how, that is how bad fat intake can contribute to the development of diabetes. You can see the connection now. So dietary factors are very, very critical in inducing diabetes. Okay? Now, the second one are lifestyle factors. Stress can lead to insulin resistance as well. When a person is under stress, there is the fight or flee situation that develops. And that person, once you are in that mode, the body does not utilize insulin properly because it doesn't prioritize digestion or food utilization as important anymore. Uh, that can also make your, your digestive system and your assimilation and uh, glucose utilization to be compromised. So if you are stressed and your diet is poor, then you are setting yourself up for diabetes. This is how far we can go today on Expose with Tony Akiyami. And don't forget, what we need is not more medication, but more education. To be informed is to be transformed, and to be uninformed is to be deformed. Again, let me remind you, after watching this episode, please share the video with your enemies. They will become your friends, because they will, they will be so happy you are giving them life-saving information. Send it to your friends, and that will strengthen your friendship. Send it to your relatives, to your colleagues, to your neighbors, to your entire family, and they will thank you for it. If you have not subscribed to our YouTube channel, this is the time to do so. And press the notification bell as well. And that will make sure you are alerted whenever a new episode comes up. If you're on Facebook, if you're watching us through Facebook right now, uh, just like us on Facebook and that will be good enough. Once again, thank you for spending your evening with me. I am Tony Akiyemi, your host on Expose. See you same time, same platform next week. Have a beautiful week ahead. God bless you and bye-bye. You can actually reverse diabetes. When you understand diabetes, you understand what it is, you understand how it happens, the risk factors, the causes, and the complications that it can give rise to. Those who already have it, to start putting measures in place to reverse it or at the very least to control it. My daughter is a medical doctor and I am a nutritionist. We co-authored Defeating Diabetes Naturally. You will find it on Amazon.com and you can also buy hard copies uh, from our bookshop, The Shepherd Stores Limited, number 18 Shogunda Street, Abuleoni Bagbo, Ikeja, Lagos, Nigeria.